Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this august panel and audience to order. Welcome to this panel from the Williams College faculty on the war in Ukraine, international political and economic causes and consequences. This discussion panel tonight is one of a number of events at Williams uh, offering students and faculty and the wider community an opportunity to engage in the issues and struggles of the war in Ukraine more deeply. So first, there is an ongoing Slavic anti-war film series that's sponsored by the Russian department here at Williams, and its next film is this coming Friday, the end of this week, 7 p.m. in Peresky Auditorium. And uh, in that film series will be shown the 2018 documentary, Yavnik Proyaviv Nyemaya. Nyemaya. I had one semester of Ukrainian at the Agriculture Department in DC, but that was in the 90s. Uh, no obvious signs is the English translation, and there will be subtitles. Also, next Monday, one week from today, same time, 7.30, same place, this room, Griffin 3, uh, there will be a panel sponsored by the Department of Anthropology and Sociology and the Department of History, and that title is The War on Ukraine, a view from the humanities and the social sciences. That panel will include contributions from faculty and students with a personal as well as a scholarly connection to Ukraine. And then finally, also tonight, uh, there's a table in the back in that corner of the room that has flyers. Uh, and there's information on those flyers on how to help with Ukrainian refugees. Finally, just one brief notice about filming. Uh, this panel and the Q&A session afterwards to follow are being filmed. You can see the cameras there. Uh, and the intention is to make this uh, talk uh, available for distribution to the Williams community via the college's internal internet, or you probably know it better as GLOW. On February 22nd, just two weeks ago tomorrow, Russian military forces entered the far eastern region of Ukraine known as the Donbas. Although internationally recognized as territory under the sovereignty of Ukraine since 2014, this region has been under at least de facto control of separatists who have established self-declared independent republics. Two days later, on February 24th, Russian military forces initiated a broad air, land, and sea military assault across multiple fronts on the de facto and the de jure territory of Ukraine. It's estimated by the Pentagon that nearly 200,000 Russian troops are currently in Ukraine, which would constitute the largest conventional military attack since World War II. We in the United States, and, and of course not only the United States, but the world, have been inundated with news on this war, virtually as it happens. I personally have become quite a connoisseur of maps of troop movements that get updated all the time on places like Twitter. But we're not only the targets of news consumption, of course. Memes and rumors and intentional self-conscious propaganda campaigns can come to dominate discussion. Think for a moment on any of the following. The Ghost of Kiev, the Snake Island Martyrs, Volodymyr Zelensky's line, I need ammunition, not a ride. Ukrainian biological weapons labs, Nazi forces in the Ukrainian military, Russian targeting of residential areas in Ukrainian cities, Ukrainian troops' use of human shields, Russian attempts to blow up the Ukrainian nuclear reactor in Kharkiv, Ukrainians booby-trapping those same facilities to frame Russian troops. You'll surely agree if you've heard any of these. We hope tonight that this panel may not only cut through many of these rumors and propaganda, but more so to enlighten our thinking regarding both immediate questions of war and peace before the world, but also on the deeper causes of this war, its consequences for both international relations and international political economy, and perhaps a vision of what our near future might hold. Toward that end, I'm very pleased to present our panel of speakers tonight. Each is a member of the faculty here at Williams, and each will speak for five minutes on his topic of choice. This will bring us to approximately 8 o'clock, and that will be followed by about 45 minutes of Q&A between the audience and the panel. I'll end the panel formally at 8.45, and then, uh, of course, there'll be an opportunity for more informal conversation if you want to hang out later on and speak. Now, the panel in order of speaking. First on my far left is Professor James McAllister, the Fred Green third century professor from the Department of Political Science 
and uh, Professor McAllister will be speaking on great power relations and the factors that may have led Russia to take military action in Ukraine. To my near left is Professor Stephen Nafziger from the Department of Economics. Uh, he'll be speaking on the sanctions regime and some economic history of the region. I'm Professor Daryl Paul. I'm in the Department of Political Science, and I'm chair of the program in political economy. And I'll be uh, commenting briefly on the impact of the war on global commodities markets and the implications of the political economic delinking of Russia from the West and its possible reorientation towards China and South Asia. On my near right is Professor Sid Rothstein. He's also in the Department of Political Science. And Professor Rothstein will be speaking on the reaction of Germany and the political changes there in light of the war and the West's sanctions regime. And then on my far right is Professor Neil Rappaport from the Department of Economics. And Professor Rappaport will be speaking on military strategy and the military situation in Ukraine, as well as the role of NATO in the war going forward. So first, let me turn things over to Professor McAllister. Great. Uh, many thanks, Daryl. Um, many thanks to all of you for coming out here tonight. I'm going to do my very best to say in no more than five minutes, because I've been warned, uh, what I can about how the current situation in Ukraine came to pass and how one important element of that history might be relevant for thinking about the negotiated end of the war. Now let me start by saying that uh, I think like everyone in this room and around the world, um, it's impossible not to look at the resistance of the Ukrainian people with anything but awe and admiration. Um, the same admiration also holds true for those brave Russians out on the streets of Moscow risking their lives and liberty protesting Putin's war. So how do we get to where we are today? Now obviously much of that answer lies in the mind of Vladimir Putin. At the end of the day, we are only going to be able to guess at his true motivations. But Putin has not exactly been mysterious about his goal over the last two decades. What he is doing now in Ukraine is probably what he thinks of as the mission of his life, trying to somehow reverse what he has always viewed as, quote, the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, there is no question that Putin bears the overwhelming political and moral responsibility for the war, but we should also not fail to consider the responsibility of America and NATO. Now, let me start by saying that NATO is without question the most successful alliance in history by far, and I am second to none in my admiration for what it accomplished during the Cold War. But shortly after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Clinton administration developed the idea of expanding NATO to include former members of the Warsaw Pact, like Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Now, while an understandable desire to embrace Eastern European victims of the Cold War and to help promote liberal democratic capitalism and many other worthy goals, NATO expansion was rightly seen at the time by many former Cold Warriors as a tragic and completely avoidable mistake. George Kennan, the father of the con uh, containment strategy that won the Cold War and obviously by no means an apologist for Russia, called NATO expansion, quote, the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. Was Kennan being overly dramatic? Um, I don't think so. Uh, he knew that NATO expansion would be opposed and bitterly resented by Russia and that it would help nationalists like Vladimir Putin gather public support by railing against what were seen as Western insults and provocations. Kennan also knew that as reco Russia recovered its strength, it would likely become more forceful in its opposition to the West. Now, expanding NATO to Poland and the Czech Republic in, 1909, in 1999 was undoubtedly painful to, uh, for Russia. Letting in the Baltic states in 2004 was probably even more painful. But at the Bucharest summit in April 2008, NATO went even further, announcing that they welcomed Ukraine and Georgia's aspirations for membership and agreed that these countries will become members of NATO. No, not considered, but will become members of NATO. This was quite a bold statement, given that both of these countries were constituent parts of the former Soviet Union with long-standing historical ties to Russia. So why did Ukraine and Georgia not become NATO members in 2008? Well, partly because key allies like Germany and France thought that bringing them into NATO at that time would be far too provocative a move towards Russia. Also, because a few months later, Putin invaded Georgia in part to send a message not to pursue NATO expansion. Since then, it has become generally accepted in the West that it would be too dangerous to let Ukraine into NATO because Russia would obviously use force to prevent it from happening. In my opinion, not letting Ukraine into NATO was and remains the prudent decision. So why doesn't the West just explicitly declare that Ukrainian membership in NATO is permanently off the table? Well, 
America and NATO have remained unwilling since 2008 to say exactly that because they don't want to appear to be bending to Russian pressure, understandably, and also because we don't want to abrogate Article 10 of the North Atlantic Treaty, which says that any European state may become a member of the alliance if all of the current members unanimously approve. Why is any of this relevant now? Well, I think we need to be reminded that rightly or wrongly, great powers have always historically reacted very badly to what they perceive as security threats on their borders. What we see as purely defensive steps are rightly or wrongly seen by Russia as actions with offensive intent. We would never accept a military alliance between China, Canada, and Mexico, and that is exactly how Russia views Ukraine's possible membership or association with NATO. Actually, Russia probably views Ukraine's membership in NATO far worse than we would uh, those two other options for a variety of reasons, which we'll probably talk about. I think we need to recognize that Russia is not going to get over thinking that way anytime soon. If there is going to be some kind of negotiated end to this war, which actually I don't know is still possible, the West is going to have to work out some way by which Russia is assured that Ukraine will not become a part of NATO. This is unfortunate for many reasons, but as President Macron said the other day, and I quote, there is no durable peace if Russia is not a part of a grand architecture of peace on our continent, because history and geography are stubborn. Macron is right, and as much as we might want to end this war wholly on our terms, we are going to have to think about the stubborn realities of history and geography as we try to negotiate an end to this horrific war. Thank you. Now, Professor Nafziger. Um, so Convis are supposed to be organized. I have like some chicken squirrel here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I, I'm not going to talk about two very different things. Um, um, and they may not fit super well in the sequence here, but, but I think it will be a nice lead into at least what Daryl's going to say. Um, the first is sort of briefly what are sort of the economic consequences of what's been going on. Um, now, in terms of the, the, the Ukrainian economy, I, no, it, there's no clear answer to that at this point. Um, estimates over the reconstruction cost of the Donbass itself after 2014 ranged into the tens to almost hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, this would be far, far more than that, um, in theory. Um, but in terms of the policies, the sort of economic warfare that's been engaged in by the West as a proxy for actual warfare um, against Russia in the, con in the sort of after, um, in, in the after effects of the start of this war, you know, there's sort of three obvious um, parts to this, these sanctions, you could call them, although they're not really all sanctions. One is the, the direct freezing of assets that the West, various Western, non-Western um, uh, polities and authorities have done. And this includes the freezing of assets of the oligarchs themselves, of those around Putin, and today Canada announced the freezing of more, actually borrowing directly from Navalny's lists. Um, but that's also the freezing of assets held by financial institutions in Russia, in particular the central bank. And, and the key thing with this is the central bank in Russia had sort of a big war chest, uh, sorry to use the pun, a big war chest in the event of sort of volatility that hit the Russian economy, and now they don't have access to more than 50% of that war chest, being the stuff that was held in foreign currencies in other banks around the world, they don't, they cannot access that. The second part of the sanctions is sort of the restrictions on Russians as Russia, Russian a access to the global financial infrastructure. In particular, this is the SWIFT, sort of blocking of access to SWIFT that we've heard about. Although to this point, that's not really all or even the majority of Russian financial or Russian banks that are prevented from accessing this mechanism to transfer funds. And we can get into why, or Daryl may mention why that's the case. Um, and finally, there's a variety of things you could sort of lump under trade restrictions or even informal private sector company pullouts of Russia. Um, we've seen you know, Nike and Levi announced they're gonna pull out where McDonald's and Pepsi have been suspiciously quiet uh, throughout all this. Um, and with, with the real issue here being whether these trade restrictions will touch on energy. I think something that Sid and Daryl will both talk about in a second. Um, but I wanna just briefly, 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 just note that, that you know, the consequences of all these on the Russian economy are going to be dire. Uh, best estimates that came out in the last week are that sort of the immediate this year effects of all this would be sort of a 10 to 15% contraction 
in the Russian economy, which starts to look a lot more like, say, 1991 to 93 than it does the like 2009-10. Um, and, and we've all seen the, already the collapse of the ruble, um, it's 35% off, 30% down, something like that. But it's really the standard of living of Russians, the ability to access food um, and other basic goods. Uh, imports are gonna be prohibitively expensive or just simply unavailable. And how they adjust to that's gonna be a real thing to track going forward. But as we've seen really in the last few days, the consequences for everyone else in the world are also dire, and I'm not, I'm again, I'm setting aside sort of the damages and the sort of cost, the standard of living effects for Ukrainians themselves because it's sort of unclear how bad those will be, but they will be bad in their near term. Um, but in globally speaking, I think that's where the real issues lie. Uh, and Daryl's definitely gonna get into this. I do wanna mention one thing that I just became aware of yesterday and that's the sort of impact this all will have on global food markets with Russia and Ukraine being big exporters of grain, particularly to the Middle East, um, North Africa, these are places that already face relatively high food prices, and it's only going to get worse from their perspective. And this all feeds into this political economy of support for various measures against Russia. So, changing gears dramatically. The reason I'm up here is not because I actually know that much about the modern Russian economy. I occasionally talk about it and teach about it. I'm an economic historian of Russia, of Imperial Russia. Um, and along the way, I sort of pick up and started to read a lot of what other people have written about, sort of the economic histories of this part of the world. Um, and I just want to mention real quickly that, you know, this, this conflict, it's not even just a result of, or it, maybe I'm, I'm speaking too much here, but not just a result of sort of the Cold War, the after effects of Cold War, but the tensions between sort of Ukrainians and Russians obviously go well back before that, well, they're sort of 19th century, sort of nationalisms of various sorts, or sort of ethnic differences or ethnic conflicts that emerged in that part of the world, but in particular coming out of sort of the famine of the 32-33 in the Holomador. So, um, Holodomor, sorry, I always mispronounce that. Um, but the, um, the thing I want to mention really quickly is there's some brand new research, it's sort of hot off the, off, off the press stuff, that shows that in 32-33 that Soviet policies while they, you know, they were trying to procure grain from the countryside while collectivizing the countryside at the same time, actually even, you know, those, both of those things targeted Ukrainians to a much greater extent than other populations. But even in and above that, Ukrainians were much more likely to die and faced higher mortality rates at that time. And this has been something that's fed into the work of Ann Applebaum and some others uh, writing in this period of time, but the quantitative evidence of the extent of this has actually just come to light. And it's sort of striking about how much these sorts of issues may or may not, I don't know, be percolating in the sort of minds of people on the ground there, as well as policymakers framing the two sides as they go forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So global commodity prices are skyrocketing. I assume we all know this in one way or another. Brent crude prices, the last I looked this afternoon, were $123 a barrel, up 35% just on last month. Dutch gas futures, up 194%. These are all just on last month's prices. Coal is up 77%. Wheat is up 61%. Corn is up 20%. Gasoline now is selling for, at least I saw on Twitter yesterday, almost $7 a gallon in California. Bloomberg today reported that over 1,200 contracts were traded today for the option to buy May Brent crude oil futures at $200 a barrel. Needless to say, this is hitting economies other than Russia and Ukraine hard. Michelin has already shut tire factories down across Europe due to supply chain problems because of the war. JP Morgan is forecasting that EU economic growth for the second quarter of this year will be 0%. The IMF is already warning of what they call a, quote, severe impact, unquote, of the war and the sanctions regime on the global economy. So far, oil and gas, though, seem still to be flowing from Russia to the West and therefore a major hole in the West's sanctions regime. Of course, this is because both Russia and Europe depend deeply on this fossil fuel relationship. 60% of EU energy consumption comes from imports, 
and Russia is the EU's number one supplier of both foreign oil and foreign natural gas. Thus, why Russia's oil and gas industries have not yet, perhaps, been the object of sanctions. In fact, a robust embargo on Russian oil and gas, should it come to pass, would probably hurt Europe as much as it hurt Russia. For example, German Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz just said earlier today, quote, at the moment, Europe's supply of energy for heat generation, mobility, power supply, and industry cannot be secured in any other way. It is therefore of essential importance for the provision of public services and the daily lives of our citizens. But of course, the contradictions of not declaring an embargo are glaring. By simply going about their daily lives, Europeans in particular are financing the Russian war in Ukraine. The limits of the sanction regime are more clear when one looks beyond the West, though. On March 2nd of this year, of course, the UN General Assembly voted 141 to 5 to condemn Russia and demand an immediate and unconditional withdrawal of its forces. That being said, there were also 35 abstentions in that vote, and those abstentions included some of the largest countries in the world, China, India, and Pakistan, three of the five largest by population. And of course, China and India are top 10 in terms of GDP. Russia itself is 11th. The United States has really been wholly ineffective, at least so far, in getting China and India in particular to join in the West sanction regime. Instead, China and Russia, for example, have drawn closer together. This, of course, is nothing new. The two economies set a bilateral trade record just last year. Russia and China have been de-dollarizing their trade ever since Western financial sanctions were placed in 2014. Uh, just to give you some comparison, in 2014, 97% of Russian exports to China were denominated in dollars. In 2020, less than 25% were. In light of Western banks, as, as Professor Nafziger discussed, the suspending financial transactions in Russia, Russian banks are already beginning to switch to China's union pay system. China has offered to mediate between Russia and Ukraine, and it's publicly blamed the US and NATO for the war. And just today, China's foreign minister stated that his country's relationship with Russia is, quote, rock solid, unquote. India, for its part, is quite dependent on Russia for military supplies and for the maintenance of its military capacity. Some two-thirds of India's military spending goes to Russia. OPEC, as well, has refused to increase oil production beyond the organization's standing plans. So assuming that the Russian economy does not suffer a complete meltdown, which of course may uh, come to pass, uh, or that Putin's government is overthrown somehow, the liberal international order, I think, will look markedly different after this war is over. To the extent that the Russian economy is deeply harmed by the war and the sanctions regime, it will surely turn towards the kind of financial measures that the US and other Western countries used during the financial crisis. Rather than the tightening of fiscal policy, which Russia has been doing a lot of since 2016, it will surely expand uh, monetary policy. The ruble, floating ruble, is pretty much finished now. Uh, the West is effectively attacking Russian bond markets as well, and thus we might see an, a full reversal of neoliberalism in Russia. If the Europeans wean themselves off of Russian gas in particular, far easier said than done, um, the, this will certainly spur the construction of, of Russian gas pipelines to China. The power of Siberia 2, as it's called, will surely get a massive investment boost from China. Just as a final comment, I think during um, driving Russia out of, of Western financial and commodities markets probably means, on the whole, less market, less global integration overall, which is accelerating a trend that's been going on at least since the Great Recession. Trade as a percent of global GDP has been trending downwards since 2008, after some 75 years of expansion. I don't think necessarily that blocks, economic blocks, will develop, but perhaps polarities as a word that's been used elsewhere. The future is certainly less about Russia drawing China into its sphere than China probably drawing Russia. And, and thus, I think Professor McAllister is correct in that this war is motivated on the Russian side by security concerns, whether they're well-placed and well-considered or not. But US, certainly, strategic interests are not going to vanish simply because Russia is an aggressor state. Concerns about China can never be far from the horizon of thought. Thank you. Professor Rothstein.
So <clears throat> I'm going to focus my remarks mostly on Germany. Um, why? Well, because Germany offers a different perspective on the conflict in Ukraine because it is one country that has already changed remarkably in reaction to the conflict. There is a sense that the conflict is quite abstract for many in the U.S. There's not that much trade with Russia in the U.S., not that much trade with Ukraine. It's pretty far away. Um, but Germany, like the U.S., is an involved bystander, but the conflict is real for them in a way that it is not here. Um, Germany is closer. I think Kiev is about a two-hour plane ride from Berlin. Um, but it's also because Germany is much more economically integrated with Russia and with Ukraine to a lesser extent. In part, this is due to Germany's overall export orientation. Its economy is based on exports rather than domestic consumption as in the US. But it's also due to Germany's unique history and its unique relationship with Russia, which for decades seems to have been stable, indeed stable enough to invest in an 11 billion euro gas pipeline project, but more on that in a moment. Um, because with the conflict in Ukraine, everything changed in Germany. The new Chancellor Olaf Scholz called the war a Zeitenwende, a watershed moment. So what's changed? I want to focus on three things. Um, the first, there's been a big shift in defense, defense policy last week. Germany committed to increasing its defense expenditures to over 2% of GDP, something it's resisted doing for decades. The second is an immediate investment in the army of 100 billion euros, which is a lot of money. The second is a big shift in foreign policy in general. For decades, Germany has tried to avoid sending arms to conflict zones. So for instance, when Ukraine first asked for help, Germany sent them helmets and tents for field hospitals. And that's changed now. So Germany is now sending some missiles to the Ukraine. And this is a really big shift. Germany is now actively involved in a military conflict. The third is that Germany finally canceled the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. This was a pipeline that was supposed to enable Germany to more easily import gas from Russia. So what do all these changes mean? And why do they matter? I want to work backwards through them. So first, the cancellation of, of Nord Stream 2. Maybe the question you're asking yourself is, why was Germany building a pipeline with Russia in the first place? Good question, right? So Germany, like the rest of Europe, but Germany even more so is dependent on Russia for, for oil and for gas, but especially for gas. And that's been true for decades. So last December, December uh, 2021, Russian gas was 32% of, of German consumption, which is huge. It is the largest source of German gas. This is what is keeping the lights on in Germany. It's what's keeping the heat on in people's homes. And it's what's keeping industry pumping out cars. Um, on the other side, Germany is paying Russia about $700 million per day for this gas. So uh, assuming that we stay on time, it seems like we're doing a pretty good job. That means that Germany will have paid Russia $36 million in the course of this event. Also, a lot of money. And this hasn't stopped, although there was a threat today from Russia to cut off the gas. And we could talk more about that um, in the Q&A. For the time being, the new pipeline is canceled. The old pipeline is still working for the time being. Um, the second, so Germany's pivot to a more activist foreign policy. So this is a move that has been supported across the political spectrum, with the exception of the far left and the far right, but does include parties that have traditionally been relatively pacifist, such as the Social Democrats and especially the Greens. And Germany has been dealing with its historical legacies for a long time. The anti-war movement is more deeply anchored in Germany than it is in many other places. And it's important to remember this is a country that's been held responsible for two world wars, and which is certainly responsible for the Holocaust. So they have a lot to deal with, and this is, a, this is present in politics. Politicians have long invoked these historical lessons in order to justify not intervening in violent conflict, and it looks like those days may have come to an end. So lastly, the new commitment to military spending, uh, this reflects its last pivot as well. And we may be witnessing the end of an era when German foreign policy was defined by a deep desire to avoid using military force. It also marks a shift away from Germany's commitment to not just, not just avoiding military force, but also to using economic channels to exert influence. So Angela Merkel, while she was still chancellor uh, for the last 16 years, <laughs> uh, popularized what is called Wandel durch Handel, that is change through trade. And the idea is that economic interdependence reduces the risk that countries will go to war to, with one another. But there is a deeper idea, which is that Germany could influence other countries, and especially authoritarian countries. It could push authoritarian countries to do better if they could hold out the promise of economic prosperity through international trade. And it's important to emphasize that Wandel durch Handel is the grandchild 
of Germany's policy towards the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union, which was based precisely on this idea of change through proximity. That if you can maintain relations with an authoritarian government, then you can influence them to some extent. And some people believe that the previous strategy worked with the former Soviet Union, that Germany was able to force the Soviets to sign on to some human rights conventions. However, in the current conflict, the lesson that Germany seems to have learned in the span of about a week is that trade does not ensure peace. So I will leave it there. Professor Rappaport. Well, thank you. As some of you may know, I'm a veteran of three wars, so I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everybody why we're, why we're here. And we're not here because of what NATO did in 1999, 2008, or 2009. We're here because of what Russia did in 2022 and the images that are splashed on our TVs and internet every day of people killed and displaced from their homes. And that is why we're here tonight. I'd like to talk uh, about what I think the military is going to do in Russia moving forward. It's very clear that Russia intends to uh, neutralize the capital and the command structures of Ukraine in Kyiv and separate out uh, Pre uh, President Zelensky and his military leadership and likely will succeed in that and will almost certainly put in place a government with a Ukrainian face which will conveniently invite in Russians to be peacekeepers and restore order and civil order in Ukraine. Uh, that is, seems to be almost inevitable because the overwhelming force that Russia, as was alluded to by my colleagues, has brought across the border. In the south of Ukraine, uh, which might not be getting sufficient attention, there's action along the Black Sea. And it's uh, clear that Russia is targeting the ports that Ukraine still controls, Maripol and Odessa. Uh, in conjunction with what happened, as alluded to, eight years ago, the Russian invasion of Crimea, if that is successful, that will uh, create a land bridge between what is accepted as Russia and Crimea, with the two bogus countries of Donetsk and Lukansk that my colleagues referred to as well as turn Ukraine into a landlocked country, which will basically hamper its economy, as my other colleagues mentioned. That will make it more difficult for Ukraine to turn to the West because their primary exports of grains and other materials move by ship, and those ports will be controlled by Russia. Not only will that uh, affect Ukraine, but it will result in Russia recreating virtually the entire control of the Black Sea that exists in the Soviet Union, except for part of Georgia. And as we noted, as we mentioned before, Russia doesn't really respect Georgia's sovereignty either. It will also threaten the sovereignty of Moldova, as well as bring Russian forces in either closer proximity to NATO allies of Romania and Bulgaria along the Black Sea. Not a good situation. The question is, why is Russia fighting this way? Russia invested over $150 billion in new weapons, weapons that Putin showed off all over. So why are they not using them? Why are they fighting like it's World War II or Chechnya? Well, there's two reasons. Either they want to or they have to. Of course, you can't exclude the want to part, but given the amount of casualties that they've already incurred and announced, it's probably much higher, I ignore the want to. So they probably have to. And why they have to? Because even with their new weapons, they're lacking the logistical support and the professional army that's especially important as you move farther away from your bases. The reason that Western armies are successful is they have good logistics teams and good lower leadership at the NCO sergeant level and lieutenant level. Historically, the Russians do not, and I think you're seeing the effect of it, which is why they're fighting this brutal, indirect fire, discriminating against cities, and not really uh, reducing civilian casualties. How could we help? We are all moved, as was mentioned by my colleagues, by the passion of President Zelensky and other Ukraine resistance. And you hear talk of a no-fly zone. Well, it's not an accident that every military leader tells you that's not a good idea. And why is it not a good idea? Because a no-fly zone requires complete control of the skies. Well, you would have to confront Russian manned aircraft and unmanned aircraft, but even more importantly, 
Russia is the, one of the world's leaders in air defense systems. <coughs> Many of you may remember the Turkish, uh, when Turkish bought the Russian air defense, how much of a complaint it was. Well, some of those surface-to-air batteries are actually in what is internationally recognized as Russia. To take out that mission in a, uh, in a suppression of enemy air defense, you'd have to attack sovereign Russia. And they're not prepared to do that, and I think wisely. So what can they do? We know what they can't do. What can they do? You need to counter their strengths and exploit their weaknesses. The Russian strength is armor. So you continue to provide them the anti-tank and anti-armor missiles that you see being used to relative effectiveness by the Ukrainian forces. What are their weaknesses? Their weaknesses are their supply chains, and, their, and especially as they move farther and farther away from their bases. So you've got to continue to harass and, and uh, counter their supply chains. It's going to be a long, difficult struggle. It's probably going to end poorly for the Ukrainians in the short run, but I think in the long run you'll see a successful resistance to the Russian occupation and aggression. Thank you. Considering we have five professors up on this panel, and you probably, at least the students, certainly know the professors love to talk and talk, we stayed pretty close to on time. So we have a good amount of time. We have uh, 36, seven minutes or so for Q&A. So uh, my intention is just simply to call on people uh, with hands up. Uh, the room's not particularly large, so I don't think you need to go to the microphone, but I think since we're filming, that might uh, be for the best. So it's up to you, but I'm happy to, to call. And if you want to address one uh, particular member of the panel, you can do so, or if you just want to present a question to the entire panel, and I'll try to distribute them as I see fit. Okay. Go here in the second row. Um, I wonder how you think about Russia controlling Ukraine, particularly if they take over Kiev and they get rid of Zelensky and they put in a pro-Russian president. I think we saw before 2014 there being a pro-Russian president and then popular uprisings getting rid of him, and now we're in this situation. How does Russia, given it takes over Kiev, sort of maintain control, maybe militarily, but then eventually you might have to pull out? And how does it maintain control over its people and, and support for the pro-Russian president and, and that kind of agenda? Yeah, I think you're 100% right. I think the major long-term consequence is not uh, a temporary, and I think it will be temporary imposition of a pro-Russian government in Kyiv because eventually the Ukrainian people will kick that person out, and we have seen how difficult it is to control an occupied territory. But I think the longer term consequence is the control of the ports and the limitation on Ukraine's access to the sea because that changes the geopolitical aspect. So I think you're 100% right. I think it would be a temporary situation, and that person or person that group will wind up with the same result as the 2014 government, the Orange Revolution. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you're in the front. Um, so we uh, heard you talk about uh, the heavy dependence of Europe on um, natural gas and uh, commodities from Russia. So thinking about it, is there a way uh, in the long term maybe uh, for Europe to get all of these commodities or part of these commodities from, say, West Asia or other routes. Um, so is that a possibility? And if not that, then are there other solutions that come to mind in the long term of Europe? I guess I'll say just briefly, I, I think there is talk about this. It strikes me as an enormous, absolutely enormous undertaking, especially, I mean, gas is I mean, primarily distributed through pipelines, right? Um, and so certainly the pipeline infrastructure between Russia and, and Europe is highly developed. Um, so any kind of reorientation would be quite difficult. Um, there's always the French strategy, which is nuclearize everything. Um, I mean, Sid, I think, might have something interesting to say to that in terms of Germany, because Germany has been exceptionally hostile to nuclearization. Um, but I don't know if there has been some rethinking, especially with the Greens and the government. I would think that that would be something they would be resistant to still. So in Germany, there was a very strong anti-nuclear movement, and the Greens actually were born out of that movement. However, in the last couple of weeks, I believe that they have now said that nuclear is no longer off the table. However, I will say, given the $100 billion investment in the army, um, you can imagine 
what that kind of investment would do to a very serious plan for renewable energy. So rather than thinking about sourcing these commodities somewhere else, you might think about how do we actually build a secure and a reliable infrastructure for renewable energy and how do we do that really, really fast. There's other reasons to do it really, really fast and now there's another one. So uh, there's, I think, quite a few people in Germany who wish that $100 billion went somewhere else. Any questions on this side? Go back over here, I suppose. Uh, way in the back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I guess the ideal, although very unlikely, solution to this would be a domestic overthrow of Putin. Um, what, I, again, not in any way like that happen, but what would like have to like set the stage for that in your eyes? You're the history of historian of Russia, Steve. Um, unfortunately, in the near term, I'm not very optimistic. Um, and also, unfortunately, today I missed there was a panel at Princeton about basically exactly this issue. Uh, I don't know. Olga, did you listen to that one? Um, so part of the issue, is, as we've all seen, is right, they've, they've really cracked down on independent media. And I think one thing striking coming out of people who are writing, Russians writing, when they're writing, you know, sort of objectively looking at the situation, they're just struck by how poor the information environment is for sort of the average citizen there um, in terms of, of being even equipped to, yes, we see protests in St. Petersburg and, and tens of others of cities, but at the end of the day, these are a minority of people doing this protesting, unfortunately, and I think a large part of the story is simply just information asymmetry. They just don't know, or they're being told one thing, um, and, and, and that's not obvious how that's gonna change soon. Um, uh, so I, I don't have a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of optimism on that front. You know, I would say one thing, dictatorships always look very stable until they're not, and then, and then they're gone. But uh, I would say, on the other hand, if we're placing all of our hopes on, on a domestic upheaval that's going to replace uh, Putin from power and put in a, a kind of liberal democratic Russian regime, um, yeah, I'm not sleeping well uh, the next, uh, for a long time, because uh, that, that's, that's really gambling. Uh, yes, it would be the ideal option, but... I'm not putting a lot of money on it happening. And Lindsey Graham solution isn't a good one. <laughs> Certainly, the, uh, uh, there was a, an attempted military coup, I think, against Gorbachev that lasted about three days um, that kind of brought about the end of the Soviet Union. Um, but then, of course, it ushered in the greatest collapse in living standards outside of plague and war that I think um, certainly Russia has seen. So I, I think even people in Russia who are not real happy with what's going on now would be quite wary as well. Uh, let's go over here. Um, since the controlling the towards would be the major issue to uh, like strengthen Russia's power, what would what, what the Western world do about it? What strategies do they implement to make sure they don't take control of the place? Almost none. Because, mm -hmm. frankly, the only uh, Unless you're prepared to confront Russia directly, you wind up with the same situation you have the no-fly zone. Both Romania and Bulgaria have military bases along the Black Sea, and there's a U.S. Air Force base close. And, of course, Turkey has bases on the Black Sea and how reliable they are, but they are members of NATO. So unless you're prepared to confront the Russians directly, the answer is, in the short run, nothing. And that's why you see nothing happen. Uh, yeah, we're here, Justin. I guess I'd like to move things away from Ukraine and into Asia. Um, I'm wondering about the implications of Russian aggression towards Ukraine for China and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd address this question to Professor McAllister, uh, given that you talked about the Western response to Russian ambitions in Eastern Europe. How do you think that China is viewing this conflict and what implications does is what the Western response to Russian aggression have for uh, conflict in, in East Asia? Yeah, you know, a couple of things. And again, I think it's all speculation. Um, I don't think China is going to react hastily based on, on some lesson that it's somehow deriving from what's going on here. This is not going to be a, uh, 
wow, things look good on Friday, Let, let's move on, on Saturday or Sunday. <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. Um, I think historically, people always think, well, you know, if, if I do, if I don't do X here, then I won't do Y there. And, and historically, that's not true. Great powers um, don't necessarily make um, inferences. Hey, you didn't, you didn't fully resist there, so you won't fully resist here. Um, so, you know, my, my sense is, I think China's going to be looking at all of this. I think China's also going to be looking at it and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, what kind of sanctions could we fall under and a whole bunch of other things. So this is obviously going to be lots of study, but, but I don't know whether there's a, a kind of, you know, simple answer as to what China's going to take away from all of this. Yeah, yeah uh, I just had a question for you, uh, Professor. Um, Obviously, the Russian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, obviously, the Russian military doctrine um, fell apart in part because of the supply chain issues, but it also seemed deeply flawed from the beginning. Uh, just like a straight push into major cities, as opposed to what has been, I think, nominally uh, the idea since World War II, which is you encircle the cities and then move it. Do you have any idea of what? the Russians were thinking when that happened? Or? Yeah, they had the same, in my opinion, they had the same misconception, and I was in the Pentagon, I said it was, I thought it was ridiculous, the same misconception the U.S. had when they went into Iraq, that they're going to be welcomed the way the French forces when they liberated Paris. You know, they are not Russian. Ukrainian people are, I work with the Ukrainian military. Even people who speak Russian, they're Ukrainian. And they're not going to welcome in invaders into their homeland, just like the Iraqis didn't wave American flags when America came into to Baghdad. So I think they were operating from an incorrect mindset that they wouldn't face this kind of uh, nationalistic resistance. And once a plan, uh, you know, as, uh, as they say, no plan, as General Petraeus used to say, and others say as well, no plan stands up to contact with the enemy. And the centralized nature of authoritarian regimes and their militaries makes on-the-ground planning much more difficult than you see in, in Western uh, militaries, where the decision making is uh, generally delegated at lower levels. So, hand here. Uh, considering you know Ukraine's alleged role as global food supplier, uh, how do you think this will project into possible food shortages around the world, and uh, do you think this will into cause some sort of a ripple effect where uh, we'll see? So unrest, you know, rather than in perhaps smaller countries that are struggling with uh, domestic production of uh, grains or, or something like that. Can you say anything I mean, I haven't read a lot about this, but yeah, it is the case that particularly several countries in the Middle East and North Africa are highly dependent, not just on Ukraine, but on Russian wheat exports. And just like the case with Russian oil, even if as, as NPR was reporting today, even if there's some place, even if there's no ban or no like explicit trade um, prohibitions on Russian oil, there's companies and intermediaries that are moving away from it. And I could imagine the same thing will happen with, for example, Russian wheat. I have no, I, I, I read something like, I mean, there's some real danger that big swaths of Ukraine won't be harvested at all. Winter wheat production probably won't, will be essentially zero. And, and that's gonna have, a noticeable impact, not, again, not probably in North America, but potentially in European shelves and definitely in other developing more lower income countries, I think, for sure. Can I, I mean, this is exactly what, and, and Neil can speak to this too, but I mean, this is one reason, one big force behind the Arab Spring was rising food prices at that time um, that hit these populations where unemployment was already quite high. Let me just add something quickly. As many of you know, I live in South America and there was an article uh, that the ban on Russian fertilizer and all the rest, the alternative sources of grain are normally Brazil and Argentina. Brazil doesn't manufacture much of its fertilizer and imports a lot, most of it from Russia. Those supplies are cut off and they have a certain amount in supply, so they're not projecting to be able to fill the gap that Russia and Ukraine are leaving because of the war, which normally they would because Brazil is such an agriculturally productive country. I know certainly that uh, China also has banned exports of fertilizer. Um, this, this happened before the war started. Uh, so this is something that people were talking about even in early February. 
Uh, there's obviously an opportunity to make strategic exceptions to the ban, so if they wanted to say, eh, Brazil, let's cultivate a, a better relationship here and we'll let you buy, uh, but we won't sell to others. Um, I guess the larger point is that even though Russia is clearly the weaker party here in terms of the sanctions regime, there's still some economic power that it can wield. Uh, I think over on this side, let's go to the second row. So obviously on social media there have been fears of a nuclear strike, but barring NATO intervention, is there any uh, real fear of a nuclear strike, tactical or otherwise? Well, I heard someone suggest that maybe before the war started, the chances of nuclear war holocaust were like 0%, and now maybe they're 2% or 4%, which that's still probably higher than anybody wants to have, right? I mean, if you're playing Russian roulette, the chances of blowing your brains out are, you know, small, but they're way above zero. Um, so I think particularly in, in Professor Rappaport talking about the no-fly zone and having this important kind of separation between Western forces and, and Russian military forces is, is probably the thing we want to maintain exactly to keep such things off the table. I, I would just say briefly, um, if Putin is losing and he, you know, sees maybe his regime coming to an end, this whole thing ending in a horrific, horrible catastrophe. I don't know, I'm not willing to say the odds are zero that he would not do something um, you know, that we currently think is unthinkable. <laughs> I think that's just a fact. Um, yeah, back here, about four rows back. On um, the current level of economic response by the United States and its allies, and of course then most costly to Russia as well as the world as a whole, what will the continued response be in the long run if this war either drags on or comes to a close and results in election victory? I mean, that's a really good question, right? Um, the, I think the likelihood of, of Russia leaving Ukraine and getting nothing is extremely low. Um, I think for the near term, at least, I think the Russian regime is willing to pay the costs. Um, and I assume their hope is, right, to, to win the war. Um, what goes on in Western Ukraine is, is kind of up for grabs. I mean, there are no Russian military forces in the West, and so um, kind of dealing with the situation going forward, whether it would be some kind of, of ongoing proxy war between the West and Russia in parts of Ukraine, I, I don't know, it's hard to say. But I certainly think that um, these effects on commodity prices, even though there's a lot of panic certainly in markets, I think there's every reason to believe that much of these uh, price spikes are going to continue, uh, certainly into the near future, probably for the next, I, I would think, four to six months for sure. Um, and that puts kinds of pressure on inflation and banking, uh, central banking policy. Uh, just for example, uh, when, when Professor Nafziger was talking about the effects on uh, Middle Eastern countries in terms of grain supplies. Uh, I was reading uh, today that uh, the Central Bank of South Africa is scheduled to have an increase in its, um, in its uh, Central Bank interest rate, but they're probably going to have a much larger one than they had anticipated because of this fear. They need to draw on capital because in times of crisis, capital flows here, right? It flows to us, to the United States. And so uh, those kinds of pressures from higher interest rates, um, and, and, and kind of forced austerity policies in, in middle-income countries, I think, will have some longer-term effects as well. And if anybody else wants to address that here. Uh, let's say, kind of in the back there, the white shirt, yes. Me. Um, another question about China. You talked about the strengthening of relationships between Russia and China. Do you see there being tensions created between the conflict of China's pillar of non-interventionism and Russia's clear lack of respect for the sovereignty of other states? I mean, the kinds of things that certainly China has been saying suggest that they don't feel any tensions. I mean, I don't think that China has any interest in backing Russia 100%. Um, I think it has an interest in drawing Russia closer to it uh, as sort of a balance. Uh, against the West and certainly kind of having some access to a lot of the natural resources. I mean, Russia's, something like half of Russian exports are in fossil fuels of various kinds. And so uh, I think there's a clear interest there. And China doesn't have to talk about intervening anywhere and sending any of its troops anywhere to at least kind of give some, not only diplomatic, but I think political cover as well to Russia. I mean, you see something similar uh, in India. India is highly dependent on Russian military sales and something like 
of uh, Indian military uh, uh, consumption is from Russia. If the United States wants to get India on board this program of sanctions, they're probably going to have to find some kind of intervention to, to supply India with military uh, equipment to try to replace Russia in some way. Now all of a sudden there's lots and lots of things that countries with its Germany investing in a military, US investing in its military. We could very well see some kind of, you know, second round of, or uh, not second round, I don't know, nth round of um, kind of central bank policy and treasury expansion to try to deal with some of these issues. I think we'll certainly see it uh, in Russia and there might be a more global coordinated response to this too if things begin to, to look a little hairy. I just want to add one thing. Remember, uh, from the point of view of the People's Republic, an intervention in Taiwan is not an invasion. <laughs> it's moving into a part of their own country. So you have to keep that in mind. I mean, they're, they're clearly don't view it the same way, right? We're on this side, yeah, in the back. Um, why now, doing this? Do you think there's any relation to his interest in sowing civil unrest in Western countries by adding fuel to inflation fire? I mean, I'll, I'll yeah, quickly, go, go no. Ahead. <laughs> I, I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think he has had a plan for a while to bring uh, Ukraine to heel in some way or to get the West to negotiate uh, some sort of, uh, you know, Ukraine can never be a NATO kind of thing. Uh, I don't think this, his, his ambitions extend towards, you know, uh, fueling inflation in the West or, or even, you know, breaking up NATO or any of these other things. This, this is all about Ukraine. That's how I see it. Well, I think at the end of the day, though, Part of that, the, those types of things, the inflation and the assumption that, that this stuff would lead to essentially a lack of coordinated response by the West was part of the strategy, if nothing else. That, well, I can sort of rely on them not getting their act together in the West and therefore I can do X, Y, and Z. Um, actually, it brings me back to the question about sort of long run economic consequences. One thing that struck me, just thinking about Russia's economy going forward is you know, the, the breakdown in sort of information channels, technological exchanges, academic exchanges, you know, this is really putting, going to put Russia well behind places in a world where they're spending enormous amounts on sort of keeping every, the lights turned on. It's going to put Russia well behind in more of a longer run growth sense in terms of technological change and innovation in that economy. I mean, Europe is all the shutting down of space programs and so on. These are just minor examples, but at the end of the day, this is, as consequences I'm not sure were really thought through. No one expected these types of sort of coordinated, we're gonna stop interacting with Russia sort of policies. And I think they also thought it would be militarily easy, not only for the welcome, but also they saw the Ukrainian military getting stronger, being trained by NATO, like by Florida National Guard, for example, so the window of the easy, the easy part that they thought was narrowing. So, you know, like, like Kali said, yeah, it, it was just the time, just the time. Go ahead, sir. And, I, and I would add also, I, I, don't, I wouldn't ascribe to Putin the idea that he intends to destabilize the West, but at least in relation to Germany, the timing is pretty good. This is, we see the departure of Angela Merkel, who spoke Russian and who would speak you know, she would speak with Putin. Um, there was also this idea of the social democratic government coming into power. The social democrats, the former chancellor, Gerhard Schröder, was one of, he is now like the chief lobbyist for Gazprom. So the social democrats have a very complicated relationship with Russia. So if I were in that position, I would say, ooh, we have a, we have a foreign minister in Germany who's in the Green Party, it's traditionally been anti-war. We have the social democrats and the chancellor in the chancellery. It's going to be very complicated for them to figure this thing out. Timing looks pretty good. So at least from that perspective, it looks like a pretty good opportunity. Uh, let's another, I, actually, I think we called here, yeah, in the green. What can Western countries reasonably expect to achieve with sanctions? <laughs> <laughs> Reasonable. That's, that's the operative word here, Steve. So at the beginning of this, the finance minister of France said that the West was going to wage, quote, economic and financial war 
unquote, on Russia. Now, he backed away from that pretty quickly. Um, but I think that captures a certain spirit, and, and particularly if this moves to fossil fuels. Um, now, again, I think the Europeans have a tremendous amount to lose from a near-term embargo on Russia. But that would have some pretty immediate um, consequences, I, I would think. What's reasonable, I, 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 in, in some sense I'm repeating myself, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that Russia is going to abandon Ukraine without any kind of concessions of any kind. I just think that's not a reasonable expectation. What uh, I think it was just today, right? The, I don't know if it was the foreign minister or, or of Russia said that the demands of Russia are um, Ukrainian neutrality, right? No NATO, no EU, and demilitarization. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Maybe Neil could <laughs> inform us a bit on that. Um, and then also this kind of thing about you know recognizing the Donbas separatist republics. That, that seems to be going a bit far. But I think those first two. Um, there would have to be something on that score uh, for Russia to, um, to, I think, take kind of actions that the West is, is wanting. So, so I, th I guess I'm kind of saying that I think there has to be some kind uh, of, of concession to Russia. If it's, you get nothing, get the hell out, I, I don't think that's a reasonable expectation. I'll just add maybe two points. I think it's a really good question. Um, just to add some data to, well, I guess I'll, I'll say two points. So the first is, part of the issue, I think, has to do with how the sanctions are targeted and who's, who's feeling the pain. There's different ways to do sanctions, and one of the ways is um, very broad, where the Russian people are feeling the pain, and I think there's, that is very often tied with some idea that the, the people will like, rise up against and, and like, hold their leader accountable for their suffering. Um, which, you know, the middle, the middle term there is the people suffering incredibly. Um, but given the distribution of wealth and given how decision making is made, there's a whole group of people who probably don't suffer from those sanctions. And the question is, how do you craft sanctions that hurt those people? The rub is, when you, when you craft sanctions that do hurt those people, the, the oligarchs, then you hurt the oligarchs in the West too. And they don't like to feel pain, so they push it onto everybody else. So, the issue, I think, you know, as, as the West thinks about sanctions is who's going to feel the pain. The, the West is going to feel some of it. So some, some statistics came out today um, in Germany of Germany. So actually this comes from, so Russia threatened, there's Nord Stream 2, which is canceled. Nord Stream 1 is still working, and that's where the 700 billion uh, million every day is going. Um, Russia actually threatened to cut that off today, which is sort of funny, because it's like before Germany could say, we're going we're gonna to cut it off, Germany, uh, Russia says, they're going to cut it off. Um, so if that happens, um, some economists have, have tried to estimate what the effect would be on Germany's economy. Upper bound of, of the hit to GDP would, three, would be minus 3%, which is a pretty big number. That's the upper bound, though. I mean, these are sort of like um, back of the envelope calculations. But it seems sort of doable, thinking about what economies did during COVID. You know, the German government figured it out during COVID. They could probably figure it out during this crisis, too. So part of the question, I think, has to come down to what people in the West are willing to push for in order to ensure what kind of sanctions are made and to, or in order to ensure who eats the cost, that it's not normal working people, but it is the people who are, you know, the, the wage price profit spiral includes the third term, the profits. So the people who are making the profits here, I think, have to eat the cost of that. So I just say that the, the question, I think, is very well taken, and it goes to domestic class politics in each of the Western countries. Would say three percent is a pretty big hit, especially oh, yeah. since there will probably be other hits that will also factor into this as well. Uh, are there any hands on this side? I think we had no, 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 no. no. Next <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this is kind of like a two prong question, but like given the kind of massive amount of investment of the Russian military in this war um and like what you were saying where like it's likely not the last at least in terms of like taking over Kiev um what is the goal <laughs> uh, like what is Russia's main goal like why are they doing this <laughs> and also kind of what is the threat to the west like I, I guess in like an uninformed opinion like does this look anything like World War Three? Like, <laughs> how like, can we use anxiety there a little bit? I mean, in terms of the political goal, I think I mentioned that, but there, to the military goal, which I assume they think will feed into the political goal, I'll let Professor Let me to actually respond. take the last part. Uh, 
Russia, just like NATO doesn't want to confront Russia over Ukraine, I'm pretty sure Russia does not want to confront NATO, uh, uh, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, or anywhere else for that matter, because if you look at the correlation of forces, to use the old Soviet term, it's all in favor of NATO, and they know that. So I, don't not, I do not think that it's on the verge of World War III. I'm not sure anyone knows what the military goal of Russia ultimately is. I'm pretty confident that what I said a half hour or so ago is valid up to Kyiv and the ports. But how far they're willing to push towards the Poland uh, border, for example, Lviv and other places, uh, they haven't done it so far. That doesn't mean they won't. I'm, I don't think they will. So I think their goal is kind of to s make Ukraine more or less a vassal state, a modern version of a Soviet socialist republic uh, enthralled to the Kremlin. And they seem to be willing to destroy the country to do that or, and kill people to do that. Um, but I do not think they're willing to confront NATO, just like NATO is clearly not willing to go in a military confrontation directly with Russia. Uh, yeah. So I guess back to the idea of what we were talking about, about energy. Uh, do we think that kind of this will lead to an increased investment in like American oil and gas and kind of Middle Eastern oil and gas, or will it maybe lead to further investments in like renewable energy and more energy independence? I mean, it seems to me that there's a big incentive, obviously, to, to, to have more investment in American production. That being said, I think the Biden administration is pretty resistant to that. From what I've heard over the last couple of weeks, that the Biden administration has been much more keen to try to twist OPEC's arm and get OPEC to increase uh, production, uh, which so far has failed. Um, hey, if Joe Manchin wants it, he may get it. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of power. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see it. But, but I mean, exactly, there's, this is a big domestic uh, political discussion. Um, and I assume the Canadians have something to say about this as well, um, because I think the Canadians would love to see uh, the, the pipeline uh, project reopened uh, that was going under Trump and that got canceled under, under Biden. Uh, who have we not had yet? How about over here? So looking forward in about five or six years, how do you see this playing out? So I just want to say real quick, and, and I find this kind of interesting, all, all the questions here. People assume that this is going to go on for a long, long time, and that there's nothing we can do about it, and all that's it. I, I would think there might be more interest in, in trying to figure out, like, how do we bring this war to an end? Now, I'm not saying I know how to do that, or else I, I, I'd, be, I'd be somewhere else not here. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it's interesting, this assumption that, I mean, if I'm going to contemplate this war going on for five or six years, that basically implies that Ukraine is going to become the European version of Afghanistan. And look, that, that's it. I, I, I don't care who wins at the end of it. That, that's a loss for everybody, and, and that's it. Um, so um, I hope we start doing some thinking about are there ways of bringing this war to an end um, quicker? And hey, look. Uh, saying Ukraine won't be a part of NATO will not accomplish that objective, but um, I, I do sense, and I, I see this on all the television coverage, there's this assumption that, you know, there's going to be a domestic upheaval in, in Russia, Putin's going to be removed, they're going to put him on a flight to the Hague, there's going to be a war crimes trial, and, and, and everything's going to be happy. Now, we don't know when that's going to happen. Um, I don't know. I, I just think, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to hear Neil's thoughts or other things about um, are there ways that we can bring this war to a, a quicker rather than a, you know, let's play this out for five or six years? But, well, well it depends on how... How this sort of affects the world order. Well, if you, sure. don't, if you don't aid the Ukraine military, then the war will end pretty quickly. Unfortunately, not in a way that the people in Ukraine would know. But you make a really good point. Modern wars don't end the way... You know, there's no surrender ceremonies on the battleship USS Missouri. They kind of peter out, and sometimes it takes a real long time. So that's a bad omen. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bad omen. I, I I say sometimes to my students, um, social scientists are not very good at predicting the future. We're in fact not even that good at predicting the past. Um, that being said, I think China would 
really enjoy being a mediator. China would love to, I think, kind of have this important position on the global stage where they get in, not the US, uh, but China, and, and tries to mediate some conflict. So I think that's something at least interesting to look forward to. We have uh, time for certainly one, maybe two more questions in the back here, and then we'll go to the back there. Uh, yeah, so Professor Rothstein, you were talking a little bit about the economic sanctions and kind of who they're impacting. Um, and it does seem to me at the moment that it's kind of widespread and evil that kind of oligarchs may be losing a super yacht here or there. They are more resistant, right, to any impacts of these economic sanctions. So I guess I'm wondering, and I think this is a hard question, but more specifically, how can you target any type of sanction to both kind of avoid that Russian humanitarian crisis and better influence the oligarchs of Putin who actually kind of hold this power? Like, can you do that economically? Yeah, I feel like there's probably, they have enough wealth nationalized that you can't reach some extent of their resources. So, like, is there a non economic way to, to approach that from like a I mean, certainly the latter point, restricting people's freedom of movement through visa restrictions is one thing to do, because people don't, especially oligarchs who are used to traveling a lot, don't like that. I would expect that if we made progress towards greater transparency in financial flows internationally, uh, which there is progress towards in terms of international taxation of corporations presently. Once there's a lot of work underway with that, I think that there could be progress made. My sense is a lot of that, that income is investment income and probably runs through places like Switzerland and the Netherlands and Ireland and places like that. Um, so I don't know exactly how to do it. I think, like Professor McAllister, if I did, <laughs> I'd be somewhere else. <laughs> But uh, I can speculate about that being a direction to, to focus on. And one unfortunate issue is after, particularly after 2014, there was a bit of a retrenchment and a pulling back of a lot of this wealth back to Russia by many of the people closer to Putin. So that there's actually less levers abroad. You can put, you know, you can identify these 50 people and say, well, if we find their assets, uh, vote here or vote there, we can confiscate it. But it's sort of small beans at the end of the day. Um, identifying them you think might have some effect, just literally pointing out that these are the people that are running the show, but again, the information differences and so on and so forth means it's not going to have much domestic effect, probably. They're even willing to give up their soccer teams. And I heard tonight that the owner of the Jets uh, yeah, may be buying Johnson. Chelsea, so there you go. Well, I feel bad for Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> Last question in the back. Yeah, um, a bit of a pivot. I was kind of curious on the Ukrainian refugee crisis. I mean, right now, obviously, governments in Europe have been very accepting, very welcoming the refugees. But I was curious on the panel's thoughts for any longer term political or economic consequences, especially if the war goes on for a longer period and if Russia, you know, doesn't go away without some extension to Ukraine. Well, certainly at this stage, Poland has the largest number of refugees. Um, I don't know if that will remain so, uh, but if one remembers the 2015 refugee crisis in Europe, it was exactly the Eastern European countries that were the most hostile to taking them. Now, there's obviously a, a more kind of cultural similarity uh, between Ukrainians and Poles than, say, Poles and people from uh, the Middle East. Um, and Poles have had Ukrainians in the country for, for quite a while now, although at much lower numbers. But I think it's a really good question because it's one thing to say, sure, we'll take 100,000, we'll take 200, we'll take 300,000 refugees for now. But I suspect that the EU is going to have to start talking about um, some kind of coordinated campaign of relief. And then perhaps even if, if this conflict goes on longer, some kind of distribution. And that's what the Europeans dealt with terribly back in 2015. And so I don't know that there's a whole lot of hope that they'll deal with it much better this time around. There is not. And eventually they'll create tensions mm -hmm. and troubles and, and other things as well. Thank you all very much.